we started out talking about this time by talking about the different uh, dates in the Bible and how they're not really wrong. They just look like they're wrong at first glance. Um, and I showed you how confusing it actually is. <laughs> and uh, okay, so I hope that kind of started us off in a good direction. Let's kind of keep building. We're going to look at David and Saul and a little bit of Solomon. Now, if you don't know, don't, don't fret about it. When Israel uh, first became a kingdom, um, they had a, a chieftain, was pretty much what it was. His name was Saul. He wasn't really a king um, in the sense of how we think of kings. He was more of a chieftain. He didn't have full power over the 12 tribes of Israel, um, and Israel was not really united. Um, they were more like – basically what had happened is Israel went into Canaan. Okay, so there's that. They're there. And they start kind of intermingling, kind of, what's going is what's going on. There, there's the Canaanites all around them and amongst them, so they just start kind of living among them and, and start becoming like Canaanites. And then they have a period of, of kind of having their own identity, but kind of that identity being, being gray areas. So that's pretty much all of the book of Judges, of uh, them going back and forth, kind of starting to act like the Canaanites, not really like anything in particular. So they have this law, but it's not really followed or used, so it's kind of like pointless to have it. So this goes on for a couple hundred years. And then uh, and then finally, uh, the areas around them start to advance a little more. And so they start seeing this, and they say, you know what, we kind of want to advance too. And so they talk to the talk to a prophet that, that's there, who's also, by the way, the last of their judges that, they've, that they had had. Uh, his name was Samuel, and this picks up in the book of 1 Samuel. And they say, look, we want a king. And God says, go ahead and give them a king. It's not really his time or anything, but they go ahead and go for it. And uh, so that that kind of starts off the, the kingdom of Israel. So let's look at a few things. For the first and, and kind of biggest issue with dating King Saul is that we really don't know how long he was king. And um, because he wasn't really um, the most important king... He really doesn't emphasize that much. Uh, you know, in, in I believe it's Chronicles, for instance, um, he's just very briefly mentioned. Samuel tells kind of stories of his failure, but really doesn't get too much into him. And then when you get to, um, I actually thought it was 1 Samuel. Um, let me check 1 Samuel before we go to 2 Samuel. Yeah. That's supposed to say 1 Samuel. I don't know why, but saying Samuel. But it says this, Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000. See what I mean? There, there's, there's, what, is that, what does that mean? We never have a total length of how long he reigned. This is the only reference. And it reads something like this, um, from my understanding, something and two years. But we just don't know what that something is. So it could be... 32 years maybe or it could be just two years or it could be and it's kind of hard to imagine all the things happening in Samuel in two years but I mean just a lot of questions there and uh, because Samuel is the only one only of the books that mentions him that actually gives a little bit more detailed um, explanation about him we're kind of just left in the dark so we're whenever he began to reign to about 1010 was when he died and was no longer the ruler when he died, King David, who was uh, just a young guy out tending sheep when, when Saul first found him, um, well, I guess when Samuel first found him and then Saul found him, uh, uh, he takes up the reign in 1010 and then goes to 970. He establishes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and uh, kicks out the Canaanites that were there. Uh, he starts building it up to make it more than what it, the city used to be. Um, so he he's the first one that really makes it the kingdom of Israel. Um, Saul was more like a chieftain. Um, so then that takes us to Solomon. Solomon takes us from a kingdom into a mini empire. Um, a, a big difference there, but uh, something that David definitely start, started the ball rolling on that. Um, Solomon was David's direct son, and after Solomon, the kingdom splits into two kingdoms. The northern one's called Israel, the southern one's called Judah. And the kingdom of Judah, which is in the south, David's descendants always ruled, one after another. There's, you know, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but in the north, it kind of becomes hectic chaos. There's um, usurpers. At one point, there's either three or four kings at the same time. It's just it's just a madhouse. So let's look at some of the things. Um, I already said that. Now, here's where Saul is almost like a mythical figure. <coughs> Excuse me. Saul is almost like a mythical figure. Because at this time, Assyria and Babylon, they hadn't come through here yet. And so what happened is the rulers of those areas were not named. What Assyria did when they would go in is they would mention the names of the rulers that they were conquering. Well, at the time of Saul, Assyria wasn't really in that area. They never went down that far. So they never mentioned the rulers. And the other guys that were there... The other powers that were interested in what was going, they, they recorded their own crap, not, not other people's crap. You know, and then you've got, like, for instance, the Philistines, who we have no records of, of them, their own records. And uh, then you have uh, the Canaanites, the Canaanites themselves, which were a bunch of warring chieftains, kind of like Saul was, uh, and not, not great at records. They just not, not, they didn't really get that. And a lot of times what we see, like, for instance, when Egypt came in and conquered is they wouldn't say the the rulers that they conquered. They'd say the names of the cities that they conquered. There's a big difference there between the Syrian records and the Egyptian records. So, like, if, if you're reading an Egyptian account, I'll say something like this. I went up to Canaan. I laid uh, I laid Megiddo to siege. I uh, I destroyed Akko. I brought Tyre under my, under my fist. Stuff like that. You get to Syria, and it'll say something like this. Um... Uh, I found Hadadezer, and uh, I shackled him up. I went down to Jerusalem. I found Hezekiah. You know, it'll go. It'll talk more like that. So there, there's there's a big difference there between the different records that are that are being kept. Um, so and then there's obviously the other problem that we have that um, very little has survived until a little bit later on. So Saul really is on the borders of being a mythical figure. Well, there's no, don't, don't misunderstand me. There's no reason to believe that he wasn't real and that the Bible is not accurate. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying as far as evidence outside of the Bible, Saul was kind of more like a shadow. Somebody that you wouldn't really even know that existed if the, if the Bible didn't make mention of it. He wasn't really an important person. He wasn't a, a world changer. Solomon, okay, here's, here's a little bit more important. Saul, not so much of an important figure. Now, the interesting thing is once, um, excuse me, once the kingdom be, gets split into north and south, we start seeing, excuse me, precise records of the kings mentioned outside of the Bible. This person followed by this person followed by this person. And you're like, wow, that's exactly what the Bible says. This is very neat. And it gives other perspectives of the same stories. It's just very interesting stuff. Um, okay, so let's let's keep going. Here's something that people don't realize. Official inscriptions are not just found anywhere. When they when they do excavations and they start they find they do a city and they start, you know, doing the different parts of the city, you don't find official inscriptions just lying around. And that's not something that happens. You find them either in temples or palaces. That's the majority of, of times of where they're gonna be. And so obviously you're seeing a big problem with um, a lot of data that we could have. Uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is obviously a divided city right now. There's very limited things that can happen even in the area of Jerusalem right now. Very, very bad for archaeologists. Um, and then Jerusalem has a long, complicated history. So, you know, it was de it was destroyed in 70 AD, shortly after Jesus died, um, when the Roman when the Jews started a rebellion again, and and the uh, Romans came in and just destroyed the whole city. So there's that. Then before that, you have the Babylonians destroying it. <laughs> and then before that, you have the Israelites taking it captive. And before that, you have a series of burnings. And before that, you had a couple cities that were built on top of each other, because they used to do. They're called tells. And so you have a long, complicated history. And so, you know, obviously we know that Solomon's temple was destroyed. We all know that, right? So uh, Herod's temple was also destroyed by the Romans. 
So where are we going to find a lot of these official inscriptions? Well, then we have another problem that Saul didn't have um, the same caliber of a capital that David did. So we're a little bit hard-pressed to find his palace if he had one. I mean, we don't really even know what that looked like. So limited excavation is possible. Herod's temple was destroyed. Herod's, te uh, Herod's temple uh, was not kind of the exile's temple. So what that means is they would use uh, uh, remains of previous uh, buildings to build new buildings and so on and so forth. Um, Babylon completely destroyed. I already mentioned this. And so then we have another problem of did those records ever exist? And not just records that mention Saul, but also records that mention David and Solomon. We don't really know what the records existed. It seems like a lot of the history of the Bible was recorded by prophets, and that those were then compiled into the books of Kings and Chronicles and that kind of stuff. So we're kind of left with not really knowing exactly what we're looking for. Did they use, like for instance, did they use papyrus like some Egyptians did? Did they use uh, steles uh, where it's like a, a rock that you carve onto? Um, did they use, you know, uh, what, what did they use? And in the Bible we, we find them talking about boundary stones and stuff, but we really don't see them talking about I erected a stele. You don't really see that. Um, so, uh, we have in uh, the city of Shiloh, there's a possible tabernacle mount there that we've discovered. I say we, I mean the archaeologists, Bible studiers, Bible archaeologists, that they have discovered. Um, it is not for sure, and there's a lot of kind of back and forth about it right now, but it seems possible. Um, the cities that are mentioned, they're all attested. That there's nothing out of out of the ordinary in, in Saul's in the in the biblical record of, of Saul that doesn't fit. It all fits. So there's really not nothing, just boring stuff. You know, we could look at well, this city existed between this state and this state, and then it was destroyed. I'm just skipping past that stuff. If you want to know the specifics about the individual excavation sites, there's lots of books that you guys could look into, but they're a little bit dry for a lesson. Uh, let's see. So let's go to where there's where stuff actually starts picking up. Now, we have very exciting stuff about this, okay? In uh, this dates to about 841. There's an old Aramaic stele which said which talks about the house of David. Now this is only 150 years after David. Um, the Bible is a historical document said that there was a man named David. And there's no reason to not believe that David existed. So then we have this old Aramaic stele that clearly says the house of David. Now this is this might seem to us not like not a big deal. Like oh well maybe it was like a mythical name. Well no that's actually how they talked about things. Like um, Ahab for instance was was referred to as the house of Omri. The same thing is said here of of this kingdom here, the house of David, the his descendants. So this is kind of a very important find. It proves that there was, in fact, a man named David who started a dynasty in Israel. Very exciting. Um, there's also the Mishis delay, which talks about the house of David again. Um, Shashank the uh, first has an inscription at Karnak, which we've already talked about Karnak a couple weeks ago, um, which talks about the heights of David. This is not a something that's been um, overly latched onto recently, because there's some people who think that he it's not it shouldn't be translated as David. But um, I think there's just an abundance of information that shows that that's how, um, from the language that it came from, how well uh, it is translates to that. So uh, I, that's, long story short, I, I totally think that that's what it is, Heights of David. And that dates to within 50 years of David. This is a um, very important find, very, very important find. Um, okay, so what's next? Um, I already mentioned about the House of David, um, talking about the person who started the dynasty. Um, they have likely found proof of Hadadezer of Aram, of Aram, but it's a little bit up in the air. He He's at the exact same time. Whoops. Um, guys, I didn't pee on myself, okay? I just spilled my tea. Uh, he dates to the exact same time, and he's the king of the exact place. Um... So the, obviously there's there's things that are up in the air, but it seems pretty likely that that's who it is. Um, 
So then we get to another little thing that's that's kind of important, and I'm trying not to waste too much of your guys' time on little details that just kind of... Let me just say this. I, I've said a hundred times about how you ought to just get the book on the reliability of the Old Testament by Kay Kitchen. Just bite the bullet and do it. Buy the book, read it, it'll it'll definitely it'll definitely interest you. He talks about the little things, the little things that I'm just skipping past. Um, okay, so um, David and Solomon had their little their little mini empire, and a lot of people have said, okay, well that that's not really historically accurate. Um, these figures of the Bible were not as big of a deal as the Bible makes them out to be, and I understand where that kind of hesitancy comes from. But the thing is, is those mini empires a little like what I mean by a mini empire is so David. Uh, and Solomon, they put like Edom and and, and um, Moab and stuff. They they put them in subjection. They had the Philistines in, in retreat. Those kinds of things. That's called a mini empire. They they didn't extend over like vast amounts of space, but they still had a little mini empire that extended past their own kingdom. And um, the dates of when this area had those little mini empires only dates to this time. It doesn't fit before or after. This is the only time in history in that area where those mini empires actually fit. So it was very interesting that the Bible said, hey, uh, here's David and Solomon's little empire that they had going on, and then when we look at history, it says, hey, this is the only time that this could have happened. So, I mean, if they were just making up stories, it's kind of interesting that their made-up stories fit perfectly in with, with uh, history. Um, so... Uh, just a few little things here, and and like I say, we could go through all the all the little boring stuff, like um, the different layers of the cities and the cities' destructions and all that stuff to prove that the cities were in existence at the time. We could go through all the different evidence that shows that uh, you know the the prices for things that were that were paid, how they totally fit with the time frame that they're supposed to be in, uh, how all that different stuff. About all the little details that fit, but but it's actually a lot easier and simpler if I just say that there's no details recorded in the Bible that don't fit, and then just kind of skip past it because that's a whole lot of boring stuff. I'm not a bureaucrat, and I really don't like that whole penny pinching stuff. It's like eh, some people get into it, I don't. So um, Solomon, ref there's a reference in um, Kings that talks about Solomon having having dealings with the Pharaoh. There is only one pharaoh of this period that had any contact with Canaan, and isn't it surprising that he dates to the time of King Solomon? Huh. How interesting. Once again, you hear people saying about how the Bible has all kinds of historical falsehoods, and yet Solomon reigned right at the time when the only pharaoh he had contact with Canaan. It's like, come on. What, what, what are we looking for here? Um, so let's look at a few things here. First Kings chapter nine. Sixteen through seventeen. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire, and had killed the Canaanites who lived in the city, and had given it as a dowry to his daughter Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer and Lower Beth Horon. So the obvious question being, why in the world would Pharaoh just conquer a city and then just give it away? Like, why would he ever do that? And um, the the thing is, this is actually a mutually beneficial <laughs> option for Israel and Egypt. So it's beneficial for um, Egypt because. That's the start of Egypt's shipping route, so they could do their half and then have you know be able to ship it through, and then Solomon had his shipping thing going on, so he could protect the northern route. So then Solomon could use Gezer to keep the Philistines in check, which would also benefit the Egyptians. So basic and basically Egypt was getting a free guard to watch over their shipping. I mean this is a win-win for everybody. Uh, the Pharaoh would be stupid to not give it to him. So he's sitting here thinking, okay. I've got a, a marriage alliance with this king, so he's kind of stuck in at this point, and let's make my job a little bit easier by giving him Getzer and letting him, you know, do that. And so, okay, 
this is something that, that some people have, have said, okay, this just proves that the Bible is inaccurate because the Pharaoh would never just give up a city. Well, it did, it would if it would benefit him so greatly. Uh, another example, 1 Kings 3.1. Solomon made a marriage alliance uh, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Now, there's a few things that need to be said. The first thing is, as far as we can tell, Solomon didn't have too many marriage alliances, and the ones that he did have weren't overly big deals. The biggest deal, like the biggest um, publicity-wise marriage that he had was to Pharaoh's daughter. Um, other ones that he potentially had were more of um, not really worth toting about. And that's why he only built a palace for the Pharaoh's daughter. Um, this was, you know, something that, that they did do. They did build, you know, um, a, a royal house for, for the marriage alliances and stuff. They would do that. But the fact that Solomon only built one tells us that there was only one wife of great, you know, um, pedigree or whatever. And that would be, obviously, the Pharaoh's daughter. Um, and then the other thing that's worth mentioning about this is anybody who knows Egyptian history knows that the Pharaohs did not send their daughters out to be married. They didn't do that. They would take the daughters of other kings in to, be, to marry them. They would take the women, but they would not give the women. So this has caused a lot of people problems. Okay, so obviously Solomon is not accurate. Well, <laughs> actually, at this time, we have multiple examples of the pharaohs sending their daughters out to be married. See, in old Egyptian history, yes, the pharaohs did not send out their daughters, but this was hundreds of years later. So that kind of little proof that the Bible isn't accurate is, is way too outdated to actually disprove the Bible. Um, at this time, they did. And like I said, building her a special abode fits historically um, very that, – that all, that all fits. Um, so then there's a lot of details that, that just add up that, once again, aren't really worth mentioning. Um, he, King Solomon has um, some labor that he hires to build the uh, temple and the palace. And how much grain he paid is is accurate for the time. Uh, also, it's accurate for the population of Israel and uh, for the demands of the kingdom. That that all that all fits. Um, the prices that were paid, um, the different horse breeding contracts that he it talks about, those all fit. Um, and then there's another detail that that people kind of bring up, and that's about Egyptians breeding horses. Um, you hear a lot of times in history books where they talk about. Uh, this can't be accurate because of um, Egypt breeding horses or some nonsense like that. that. That's nonsense. Egypt couldn't get their horses from, from the Turkey area anymore because of the whole Hatani problem that, that arose and then the, the fall of the, you know, the Mitanni and all that that I talked about a couple weeks ago. And then you know with that whole situation that developed, Egypt had been having to horse breed for at least the 13th dynasty, so there's that. Um, let's see what else. First Kings 5-6. Solomon says this thing uh, to the uh, king of Tyre. He says, Now therefore command that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me, and my servants will join your servants, and I will pay you for your servants such wages as you set. Uh, as you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidon Sidonians. Well, he's actually talking to the king of Tyre. If you back up, it says, Now Hiram, king of Tyre. So we have a little bit of a problem here, but fear not, this is easily resolved. Um, in before the time of Solomon, um, the two Phoenician cities that were really pot well, no, it, Phoenicia had a series of cities that were popular. There were Byblos, uh, Sidon, Tyre, and there was another one too. I just forget what it was called. I think they had four or five big cities. Well, Tyre really wasn't that big of a deal, but then throughout the course of time. Sidon became kind of less popular, and Tyre kind of took up precedence as this is the city, the Phoenician city to get your lumber from instead of Sidon. But Sidon at this point kind of became synonymous with Phoenician. So instead of saying there's nobody who can cut timber like the Phoenicians of Tyre, you could just say it's the Sidonians, and Sidonians was kind of like a blanket term. 
So yet again, this thing that is that is ta taught it is proof that the Bible is not accurate is actually proof that it is accurate. It's so accurate that it's been preserved <laughs> phenomenally well. Um, so okay, there's there's that. Uh, 1 Kings 9, 10 through 14. There's a lot of little things, little details that oftentimes when we read, we just kind of skip over. And they're the exact things that people use to say, hey, the Bible is not accurate. But if you actually just stop and look at history, it shows that they are accurate. 1 Kings 9, uh, 10 through 14 says this. At the end of 20 years in which Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Hiram, king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress, timber, and gold, as much as he desired. King Solomon gave to Hiram twenty cities in the land of Galilee. But when Hiram came from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, they did not please him. Therefore he said, What kind of cities are these that you have given me, my brother? So they are called the land of Ka uh, Kabul to this day. Hiram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. And then you get to Second Chronicles 8, 1-2. through 2, which is said to be a contradiction, and I don't believe it is. It says here, at the end of 20 years in which Solomon had built the houses of the Lord and his own house, or the house of the Lord and his own house, Solomon rebuilt the cities that Hiram had given to him and settled the people of Israel in them. So then you come to this conclusion, okay, so obviously this is a contradiction, because Chronicles said, that Tyre, or I'm sorry, um, not Tyre, uh, brain fart, uh, Hiram gave Solomon cities, and in First Kings it says that Solomon gave Hiram the cities. So who gave who? Well, actually, if you look a little bit closer at the situation, it seems to be that there's a form of bargaining happening here. Um, it starts off with, you know, they make the agreement, and the agreement comes to fruition. Now, this is something that is historical. They, they, they do, they, this is, they totally did this at the end of the contract. They were making the account even. Okay, so this is something that isn't uh, unique to Solomon and Hiram. And uh, so then Solomon gives uh, Hiram these, these cities, which he's not crazy about. Uh, and there was also an exchange of money that was made, but Solomon also exchanged some, exchanged some towns to Hiram as well, which Chronicles tells us. So what's happening here is they're having a little bit of a bargaining. Now, if you know anything about the Middle East you know that their bargaining practices have been pretty steady for thousands of years. They're, they're very shrewd businessmen. Very shrewd businessmen. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's legendary. People talk, a lot of historians talk about how they've always been kind of uh, shrewd. Um, okay, so apparently what happened is they both compromised a little bit. Uh, Hiram took some things that he really didn't want, and Solomon didn't really take some things that he really didn't want, didn't want to take because it was beneficial for both of them. Because of where the areas were, Hiram got the area that he he wanted. Hiram got the area that he wanted, uh, even though it in, involved some cities that he wasn't really a big fan of. And Solomon got an area that he wanted, even though it had some some things that he really didn't want. So they shouldn't be seen as a contradiction. This should just be seen as recording the two different sides of the bargain. Which actually, um, I don't know if I if I mentioned this before, but Kings and Saul and Kings and Chronicles actually does this in another place. Um, David tells uh, his, I think it's his general Joab, to take a census of the people of Israel, and it says that Joab lied about the number. And one of the books has the lie that Joab told, and the other one says the actual number of how many of how many Joab counted. And it's just so funny because. <laughs> it, it, it that just amuses me that 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 one of the books didn't even record the real number. It's like no no no, let's just write down what, the lie that Joab told, <laughs> and then the other one actually gives the real number. But once again, it's not a contradiction. That's you know that's the number that Joab said. It's not the real number, but it's the one that Joab said. Um, so then we get to a little account that has thrown off a lot of people. There's a queen from a place called Sheba. And she comes to visit uh, Solomon. And a lot of people have said, see, that would never happen. So that can't possibly be historical. But yet again, there is a very limited time frame um, of, of ancient uh, Near Eastern history when the queens of the south were actually sent as emissaries in their king's place. Uh, okay, so like uh, an ambassador, um, somebody who goes in your stead. Like, let's say you're the king and Joe's your, your wife and said you're the man, okay? 
and you want some business taken care of, but you can't go yourself, you'll send Joe in your stead. You'll, he'll be your emissary. Um, so this is actually um, yet another thing that people thought disproved the Bible that proves it. <laughs> this is a very limited time frame of like 300 years when these uh, queen emissaries were used, and Solomon fits directly in that time. So it's just amazing, again, with the details. Um, it doesn't, it, after I believe it's the 600s, um, this is not a thing anymore. And before, I want to say 1,000 or 1,100 or something like that, it wasn't a thing. So you really have just a short window of, of opportunity for this to have happened exactly like the Bible says. <laughs> Again, um, the Queen of Sheba probably came for trade as well. It's not mentioned in Kings, but you can probably read in between the lines and she probably was there for trade. Um, especially since Solomon was becoming, like I said, a mini empire, and there were a lot of trade routes that were going through, which was obviously going to affect her. And if you look at 1 Kings 10, it kind of hints to this, okay? Look at this. Starting in verse 1, we'll go through 13. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones, possibly trying to establish some kind of a trade. Um, and when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind, and Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my, whole, uh, until, and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I heard. Happy are your men, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Uh, never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Now listen to this, okay? We're in the middle of talking about the queen of Sheba. Now look what 11 says. Moreover, the fleet of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, uh, brought forth, uh, brought from Ophir a very great amount of almug wood and precious stones. And the king made of the almug wood uh, supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, also lyres and harps for the singers. No such almug wood uh, has come or been seen to this day. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked besides. Why is that right in the middle of this account of the queen of Sheba? Because she's there to establish trade. And while she's there trying to trying to figure out the trade routes, Hiram comes in with the fleet with all this with all this merchandise, and it's like ah. Oh. <laughs> so you have this this haggling once again. Remember, Middle Eastern people they have the, they they do this whole haggling thing. Um, and King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked, besides what was given her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her homeland with her servants. Okay, so uh, this is this this fits absolutely. Um, the temple and the palace decorations. There's nothing un that doesn't fit historically about that. The amount of gold Solomon had. Um, now here's another thing people say. Okay, it can't possibly be true because of the amount of the riches that Solomon is mentioned to have. Well, actually, we have many, many accounts, many accounts. If anybody's interested, I can I can put them in the lesson for two weeks from now and a couple quotes that talk about how the vast quantity of gold that they had, and it makes Solomon's amount seem like not that much. Uh, so, you know, anybody who says it can't possibly be historically accurate because that's just too much riches, they don't know ancient documents. This is not this is not over and above, like um, the realm of reasoning, the realm of possibility. Um, so that totally fits the time. Um, Solomon's writing style. Okay, here's another big big point. So Solomon wrote a few different books, at least in part, if not in whole. Um, Proverbs he wrote most of, not all of it, because it clearly says that Hezekiah went and, and uh, made some additions. And then it says at the end there's a couple of other wise people that, that are quoted and that kind of stuff. And so there, there, there's other people. He didn't do the whole book. But it fits in the time frame. We have other Proverbs by other um, nations. 
Um, we have uh, Ecclesiastes is a good example. Um, Song of Solomon, we have an Egyptian love, love, po uh, love poem to compare that to. So these are all things that fit. Solomon's writing style and his content perfectly fits the era. There's nothing there that raises alarm. So really what we're seeing again and again and again and again is this proves it, this proves it, this is not disproven, this fits. They all fit. All these details fit. And all these things that people brought up saying, no, that can't possibly be historically accurate, it's just more things that shows, yes, actually this was something that was possible and really only fits in the time frame that the Bible said that it happened in. Which, once again, that kind of brings us to the problem of how could they have known these historical details if it was written far afterwards? And, I mean, how? why would they have included all these little details, all these little details that fit at that time? Why wouldn't they have just excluded the details? If I was making up a story, I wouldn't include details that actually just magically fit the era for no reason. Like, I would have just left it all off. I would have just said something like this. All the kings came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Why, why single out the Queen of Sheba? Well, obviously that rings of truth when there's that, that much precision to it. Um, it's like when somebody's lying to you, you can tell because they'll take, they'll take a, a part of a truth to kind of reinforce what they're saying, and then they'll build on that with a lie. So you can kind of tell what's a lie by noticing the one part that's actually truthful. So any questions about the lesson tonight? Okay, when we start looking here in a couple weeks, remember next week is canceled, so here in like two weeks, we're going to start looking at uh, uh, sources outside of the Bible that start talking about the kings of Israel, and we're going to start comparing the, uh, the, the situations from what the Bible says versus what the other uh, non-biblical uh, data says. So, okay.